So had Pete already started PWL and you were working elsewhere, and then he invited you to work there, or? No, uh, what happened was I got fed up with TMC because um, I asked Bernie, I said, Bernie, look, I'll borrow some money on my house. Um, we can set up another studio downstairs and keep the one upstairs. He said, oh, no, I don't do that, Peter. I said, why not? So I don't want a partner. I said, well, mm. okay. And then I was locking up a couple of nights later and I just was in the cupboard where the alarm was and there were some studio sound things there. And I just looked in the back and it said, finance it's available for studio development. So I phoned, and it happened to be Tony Mansfield's accountant, strangely enough. Mm. So I phoned this guy up and he said, I might have a ready-made situation for you. And then he, he said, don't tell anyone that man for man is looking for a, someone to take over his studio in the old Kent Road at the workhouse. Mm. And um, I went along and had a look at the studio. I wasn't allowed to say anything because the owners that owned it, they were, it was losing money hand over fist. It was in debt and everything. And uh, mm. they were, I think they were junkies, basically. So I wasn't allowed to say anything. I had to make out I was interested in coming for a session. Um, Anyhow, we did a deal and Manfred bought out the existing partners and I bought my share for what he paid them, basically. Mm. And then the first session I did in there was Pastor Dushy, number one. Oh, wow. And that's the link with... And that was, uh, that was another... the, the week I walked in there. I didn't know what I was going to do because I come from TMC where the average hourly price was about £30, £35 an hour. Mm. Manfred's studio was almost double that. And, uh, I thought, how do I get my clients from all the way down there, up here, in Old Kent Road, and get them to pay twice as much as well? And there's mm. no parking either. And that was a problem. We used to get the cars broken into continually up there. It was a nightmare. But um, I stayed there five years. I was in partnership with Manby, and we did China in Your Hand, um, Pastor Duffy, I said, and the whole album with the kids, with the music for youth, um, Paul Young album. Rolling Rat album, loads of stuff there. And wow. Kit and what was the other band? Doctor and the Medics. Um, I did quite a lot with Jimmy Lee from Slade as well, and John Parr from uh, St. Elmo's Fire fame. Um, loads of stuff. And then, then it got to the point, Walter was really jealous of me having my own studio. But eventually, he sent down Mike and Matt. Uh, they couldn't get in the marquee, and they came down to record um, Hazel Dean's Wherever I Go, Wherever I Do. Oh wow. And we, we sat there and I thought Matt was mad. He, he spent a whole day listening to snare drums. I said, for God's sake, you know, get on with it. Yes, that'll do. <laughs> Any old snare. And they, they always hated me because I said, look, based on it's just a bit of bump and a bit of click. That's all you really want. And I didn't mean it quite like that, but they were being so pernickety over it and it was just driving me around the bend. Anyway, we, we finished that off and uh, and then they went back to the marquee and then Waterman bought the place of, in the vineyard. And then he kept ringing me saying, can you come and mix some stuff for me? And I said, well, mm. I can't, I'm really busy. And I was genuinely busy. And, and then I went quiet and I phoned him up and I said to him, uh, Pete, do you still need any, any mixing? I said, yeah. He said, get down here quick and mix yourself a hit. That's ah. the title <laughs> of the, the book. Um, and that was that. I went down there. And I had a manager at the time, Safa Jaffrey also died recently quite suddenly. That was terrible. He's a lot younger than me. I don't know what happened. Somebody went to hospital for something and he had a stroke or something. It was a terrible business. But um, Safra was a real good laugh and we got on well, but he wasn't getting me anywhere. As it happened, he went on to do the news and make a couple of million quid, but it doesn't matter. Um, never mind. <laughs> but I wasn't doing any good with Safra and, and then Walter Mouse offered me to come in and I said, what about Safra? He said, well, you have to dump him. You know, so. I can't let you working with the manager because I'll be managing him. So I had to make a decision then. And so I, I, I left Jaff and went, went in with Waterman. But I still had the workouts at that point in time. Mm. I was working all, he said, you've got to work all night as well because Mike and Matt are recording during the day and Phil Harding is using the other studio by night. I said by day, so you'll have to work at night. So I didn't raise that at all because I, I hated working at night, but I was going to get something like two and a half grand a week for it, which mm. in the 1980s was, I don't know, Good man. Yeah, mm. 1985, 86, wasn't it? Mm. So um, that was that, and I started working there, and then I'd finish in the morning, go down to the workhouse, check with Jane that everything was all right, my secretary down there, and anything was needed, sort it out. And then eventually Walter bought it off me. 
he bought the workhouse as Studio 5. Oh, wow. Didn't know that. So while it was used for making demos and this and that and the other, and Rick was in there doing quite a bit, and then it burned down mysteriously one night after I left. Um, really? A session had come into work, uh, some guys writing, and I went home and went to bed. And then I got woke up at five in the morning. Can you come quick? The studio's on fire. Oh, God, I <laughs> jumped out of my bed and it was gone. It was just a shell when I got there. And it was beautiful. We had it all redone. It was fantastic inside from the original. We had about a year closure where we refitted the whole place. And it was really beautifully done inside. Mm. But there, that's all gone now. If we go back to whatever I did, because that was a very innovative record, I think. Hazel, whatever I do, wasn't it? Because yeah. If I remember, um, Pete Burns heard it one morning and wanted um, you spin me around to sort of be sound like that, basically. Is, were, were you involved with the Dead or Alive project? or was... No, not really. Uh, I, I was still running the workhouse at that point. Dead yeah. or Alive, that, that was done down at um, the marquee with Bill. Um, I think it was a bit of a nightmare session, to be honest. But I, I do mm. remember them bringing it in to me because it didn't sound right. And can we ever listen to it on your JBLs? And I thought, crap, it's all middle. There's no bass at all. It's just mm. really hurting. Mm. I tried to, to tweak it a bit. But I think they went back and mixed it again after that. But they've been mm. so long on it. And it, those records are really hard to mix because they're very clattery. And the mid-range gets really full up and, and you lose the bass. And it's very difficult to balance those things. Mm. They eventually got it right because uh, it was a big hit, obviously. Mm. Yeah, I didn't, been... to do that. Well, I didn't really come in... The first few sessions I did at PWL, I was doing them on an hourly rate. Um, Phil was on holiday and I was using his studio. I did uh, Carol, get ready, what's that? Carol Hitchcock, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. Get ready, I did a bit with them. Um, oh, who did Simon Smith with his dancing bear? Uh, name escapes me. Um, anyway. No, I've lost that. And I did uh, the house party with Phil Fear and um, what's the name of the book about North? Georgie Vane. There he is. That's the one. Did some stuff mm. with him and and a bit of uh, Morgan McVeigh as well. Just mm. bits and pieces I was doing, really. And I thought I wasn't really doing doing that well there. And I didn't get any calls from Walter for ages. I sat at home for about six weeks, I think. I didn't get any work at all. And I was still at the workhouse at this point. Mm. And then... Um, I went to the workhouse one day and she said, I've had a phone call from Pete Walton and says, I want you to go to the Christmas party. <clears throat> the PW the PWL Christmas party. So I went along and with the wife. I didn't really feel like one of the team, to be honest. I felt a bit of a social out outcast with them. And then he took me to one side and he says, uh, keep sharp because you've got 35 tricks, tracks to mix next year. This was, this was, this was I thought 35. Bloody hell, because mm. yeah. one reason that I hadn't heard they were recording the recording all this mm. stuff. and that was it. I went in and I didn't really stop after that. It was every day mm. one non stop. Can we pin a can we pin a date on a year on that? 86, 87 86, or yeah. 86, yeah. 87 it really all kicked off, didn't it? Down there. Yeah, but with with Rick and Mal and Kim. Um, yeah, before that I did Heartache. Heartache was one of the first was the first hit I had there. Um, yeah, and I didn't even get a credit on it. It, oh. came, it came out and mixed by Stock Aitken and Waterman, and they had nothing to do with it, apart from Waterman said, yeah, I'll get it done. And they <laughs> just gave it to me to do, and that was it. I, mm. and I, changed, I even had the girls back singing it again, and redid loads of stuff, changed all the drums, edited it around, loads of editing on it. Um, and it came out, and it's still, Waterman said to me at the Hip Factory gig um, a couple of years back when they had the, the O2 thing, he said, you know, that still sounds good today, that record. It still stands up. But I, what I tried to do with that, I tried to make it a bit American because it had that kind of Billie Jean bass and, mm. and the snare drum on it. I did an ordinary, like, Lynn snare. It didn't sound right on it. So I took this snare that we've been working on, that we've been working on from... I was doing a mix for them and they wanted it to sound like I'm only human. You know, the human lead thing. Mm. And I got this snare sound. They, they did quite nice. Mm. And I put that on on this Pepsi and Shirley record. And it's just mm. a really, it sounds just like a rim shot, but the time you put a load of reverb on it, it sounds like a big snare, you know. Mm. It's, it, on its own, it sounds pathetic. But um, 
that was it, that was that. And that's, no diff that's quite different from all the other snare sounds on the PWR records. It was much more mm. boof, that, boof, that, rather than boof, 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 But yeah, but after that, I can't remember when Mel and Kim came along. It wasn't long after that because they had showing out. I had nothing mm. showing out, but they, they gave me respectable to do. And, mm. and I mixed it, I thought it sounded good. But Waterman said, I can't hear what they're singing. I said, no, well, I couldn't either, really. <laughs> I said, they're, they're not enunciating their words properly. So, uh, so they got the girls back in, and then I mixed it again. And I thought it was sounding great. And, and, but the, the powers of the um, Supreme Records, uh, Nick East and that, they weren't happy. I think they had um, follow-up itis, you know, because when you've just had a hit, it's very nerve-wracking to release another one. Mm. And they kept wanting it changed. It's around that way. I think I did six mixes all together, and then Walkman said, we we'll take a different way. And he made me do a, a Jack version, a, a Jack Your Body type version, totally different bass, totally mm. different sound. And that threw everybody right off, and they went back to it. Oh, then they'd been told, to, we were told to take out the Tay 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 bit. Really? Yeah, honest, yeah, that was it. Take it out, take it out. And then the girls were, had gone away to Holland and doing a gig, a live gig, and they went on stage and they did. They had a tape of Respectable, and they just started singing this tape, tape and the crowd went mad, you know. And mm. we got called, leave it in, leave it in. <laughs> yeah, that was the biggest hook. I think showing up was 86, and yeah. Respectable was 87, if I it remember. It was 87, yeah. Yeah, because I remember that uh, quite well. So, and then Kylie came along in 88, 89, is that yeah, right? I had my invoice book here with me. I could tell you exactly where they came about, but um, Kylie was a bit later on, wasn't it? Um, yeah. 89, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, know, I remember doing that. I remember meeting in the pub and I said, what am I doing tonight then? Because I used to meet them in the pub. They were going home. Yeah. The they said, oh, you're doing this Australian girl. I said, yeah, right. what do you sound like? Oh, sounds a bit like a singing budgery girl, but... Uh... <laughs> Will we get away with that? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. I didn't think she sounded like a singer. Personally, didn't. No. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, just about. Anyway, um, I had real trouble with her vocals. She was singing through her nose, and, uh, and it really peaked. We had these Genelec, not Genelec, um, Uri speakers with these big square blue horn, mm. and it really peaked in this horn. Her voice, nee, nee, nee. so I, I devised a way of uh, on the SSL, you, you can make the compressor frequency conscious mm. by putting the EQ in the side chain. So I put the the side chain peaked it at 2k and so it, every time she got her into that every time she went into that 2k area it just turned her down and automatically so that worked well mm. good um around that time i think you you did a boney m mega mix uh you did a boney m remix album is that right and then uh, i yeah. did a, do you remember doing the, the remix album yeah of course i did I don't yeah <laughs> No, I don't well, remember. I, what bits and pieces. I don't forget all the stuff that I've yeah. done. You've got a good memory, actually, better than mine. Um, but we've never actually been, we've never actually met, I don't think, in, in the no. same room. But you did the remix album, and then I did the mega mix, and then it suddenly got to number one in France. Oh, and God, the, I didn't even know about it. Nobody no, told me either. Uh, it wasn't uh, Chris, Chris Tarrant. <clears throat> I was driving to work. Um, it was a daytime session for a change. I think, I can't remember where I was going. Anyway, Chris Tarrant came on the, the radio and, uh, and he said to the audience, he, he was transmitting from Cannes, south of France. It was in the summer. And he said to the, the contestants, and he's this competition they had, you've got to go out and find a millionaire with a bottle of champagne and you've got to find out what's number one in the, the French charts. So away these people went and then they came back and they said, I've got a millionaire with a bottle of champagne and the number one record in France is Boney M. And I nearly, nearly crashed the car at some point. And then I looked mm. at it and I phoned up. I said, yeah, it's number one. Nobody told me. Nobody told me a bloody thing. No, I get that. I, I find out something's been released. I thought, oh, I didn't know that was going to be released, but never mind. I'm not talking about the Bodie M. Uh, well, I can't even remember, to be honest, but I have a feeling. I, I knew, knew, certainly knew it was going to be released on a promo, but I didn't know it being released in France. And suddenly um, it was a massive hit. And I was actually invited over to France in 1989. 
uh, while it was number one. And then I did a village people mega mix on the back of that. But uh, strange, isn't it? So, so there was another band I worked with, which was quite underrated. Was a band called Latin Quarter. Oh yes, I've heard of them. Um, mm. I did Safka, sorry Safka. Um, Saf, not Safka. Steve Jeffers, Jaffa. They're both called Jaffa, basically. One's Jeff and one's Jaffa. They called him Jeff because he was ginger. But Jeff, his name's Steve Jeffries. And he was the keyboard player of this band. And I'd mixed Roland and that's rap, rapping. And he was the one who put that together. And so he said, will you work with my band? And I said, yeah, all right. And they came to work out some, we did uh, the first single was called Radio Africa. And it's still one of my favorite records that you asked me. Mm. To so you know, it's nothing can... to do with PWL or anything like that. It's not even a PWL sounding record. But it's it's a great atmospheric record and in mm. my it's all about the hard times and bad stuff going down in Africa. Mm. If you ever start, never listen to Radio Africa. Mm. I certainly will. I remember it. I remember the track, but I haven't heard it for for it's a while. Play, but it didn't chart very high. Yeah. Should we should we go into the nineties then? Was that because you presumably at some stage you stopped working with them? Uh, or can you just explain what happened in the nineties and early nineties? Uh, well. If you, you know, want to. Strange things happen. For instance, with Kylie, especially for you, I didn't get asked to mix that. I wasn't getting the, the prime jobs anymore. Um, and several things happened like that. And, and then there was a yell episode where, um, well, the record that I'd done with Simon Cowell, mm. uh, I'd co written parts of it as well. And Waterman kind of blackmailed Simon Cowell not to release it, threatened. Um, if he released it, he wasn't going to get the Hit Factory 2 or Hit Factory 1, Hit Factory 1, I think it was. <coughs> so Simon had to cave in there. Simon really loved the record and he wanted to mm. release it. And so all the, the marketing people loved it. And that really gave him the hump, you know. And then Walter and Nick the band off from me and I wrote a dreadful song. It took six months to write it. Well, I think the boys wrote it. And that virtually sunk the boys. I'd done two records with them before that, Instant Replay and... Um, I can't remember now, but this was my chance again to get some recognition, and it got the rug got pulled out for me again. Mm. Um, so that was one thing that gave me up. Then I wasn't getting the gigs, and then I was given a, a Shaking Stevens album to do, which is right, not really up my alley at all. Mm. Sort of my mm. um, and then they actually eventually they came to me with, especially for you, because they couldn't get it right. It, it just wouldn't sound right. Same with Better the Devil You Know. They tried mm. those other people mixing it. And it wasn't until I did it. Um, especially for you, I replaced all the drums with it because they were all out of time. They were all mm. late, about 10 milliseconds late, the bass drum was there. Which is terrible on a, that sort of record. Mm. That's why it felt like it was dragging. Um, and I gave it a lovely treatment, created that intro. That intro wasn't on it with the vocals. The ooh, 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 I did all that myself. I didn't sing it, but I used mm. the songs from the bridge where that happened and made this Disneyland kind of intro to it. Um, mm. And with Better the Devil, it got rejected several times, mixed by other people. And it wasn't until I did that one and, and added all the, the quirky vocal bits in it. They, oh, 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 mm. oh, that wasn't in there, none of that. Mm. And there was no third verse in it, it was just a blank. Mm. It, it just wasn't, wasn't a record, proper record. I spent two days on it. Mm. But then, then all those things were mounting up and in the end, I wasn't getting a fair crack of the whip. Waterman wouldn't let me sign the Musicians Union consent forms, which were generating quite a lot of money. And then, you know, you're familiar with those? If you, if you played on a record, you're supposed yeah. to sign this consent form and you got a payment when the video was shown mm. or when the artist performed to a backing track. And I wasn't allowed to do that. So I used to see these checks coming into A Lynn. You see, when they came through the door, it had addressed to A Lynn from the MU. <clears throat> I knew it was money, and it should have been going to me, not him. Mm. And I got angry about that. Um, and in the end, it, I just had enough there. I wasn't getting any publishing or anything. I wasn't getting any royalties. Mm. I get a few royalties on Boney M. I got some royalties on Captain Shirley and a bit on um, the album I did with uh, Patsy Kensett. Mm. But I wasn't I... entitled to any of the big money from their records at all. Mm. I didn't let me have anything, not even the MU consent form money. So... In the end, I just had a walked away, you know. Mm. So we'll, we'll try and speed things up a little bit now, because um, 
uh, 90s, what would you say the 90s, as the 90s progressed, what would you, what were you doing in the, after the period you left PWR to the end of the 90s? Um, well, I, I don't know if I'm running out of time, I'm probably whopping on too much. Um, I, as soon no. as I left, I started getting offered loads of things. Um, and I discovered I'd been offered loads of things while I was at PWR and I was told, um, the people EMI were told that I was too busy to do a, an album for them of some artist because I was doing Carly and I was doing nothing I was sitting at home um, that was another reason I left but I got off a tape that and then I did uh, a record with um, Come Outside I did with Bruno Brooks and um, Frank Bruno and Sam Fox and I did an album with the the ABBA what they called the name will come to me in a minute anyway that was all good fun, but I, then Zom, I was working in Metropolis, doing a lot of the stuff mm. there, and then I did a deal with Metropolis to write some songs in downtime, and I did that, made a whole album in there, but nothing ever came of that. The singer wasn't really there, to be honest, the singer we used, which didn't help. And then um, and then Zomba came along, um, and they, they begged me to go and sign to them as a management team, so I went over, eventually, I didn't want a manager again, but eventually they talked me into it. And I thought I was going to have the top boy managing me. When I got there, it was a girl called Fiona who wasn't really managing me. They just wanted me to fill their studios, basically, which is what I did. I did all the, mm. the TRF thing happened about then with the Japanese. What's the name of the, the girl, the group, the, the, the ABBA colours? What are they called? It's OK. Beyond um, again, beyond again, beyond again. Ah, beyond again, that's the other yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There they come eventually. There um, are. Yeah, then, then I got offered this job from, from Japan. Um, a TRF, which is a Japanese. Uh, do you know of them? No. Yeah, I think I've heard of them. Yes, Japanese. Well, anyway, the, the guy Tom, the head of Avex, he um he'd been trying to get hold of me, and Waterman wouldn't give him my number. But he eventually tracked me down, um, found me at Zomba, and said, "Will you mix this album for me?" I said, "Okay." What do you want? He said, "I want it to sound like it came out of Europe," and it didn't sound like that at all. So I just songs are all structured in Japanese style which is all wrong mm. so I was restructuring the songs did loads of overdubs sent it back um, got paid some good money no royalties again because Japanese I was told don't do royalties but anyway uh, it went to number one out there and they sold 30 million records in Japan alone you know I did three albums all together and then I got bored with that um, before that I was working with Simon as well doing some stuff with his label, IQ Records, I mm. mention that. That was what I did straight after PWL. I did yeah. Um, and we actually used to go into PWL and hire their studios <laughs> to do really? yeah. Sophie Lawrence. We went in there and hired yeah. to do it. I, I did a okay. deal with them because they had no one in there. It was, mm. it was really wound down at that point in time. So, yeah, and, I, and then I got bored with working with Simon. And that's when the Japanese thing came along, just about that point. Mm. Simon stuff was getting very cheesy and the Sonya records and Zig and Zag and all that crap, you know. Mm. And the Mix Masters, remember that one? He had the Mix yeah. Masters. And, then and one, of those, one of those we did got rejected, the George Michael um, compilation got, it was like a mega mix. Mm, I remember that. Blocked by George Michael. He said it was ruining his art, artistic work or something. Yeah. It was going smoothly, really. Until the Japanese thing, and that, that lasted two or three years. And then take yeah. that take that happened quite early on. I did two records with those those guys, mm. and then I had a falling out with a record company through no fault of my own, nothing to do with me. They they balls up something, and I got the blame for it. Mm. I I got an interesting story there with uh, Simon's um, Wham mix because I uh, actually lent him uh, a copy of my Club Fantastic Mega Mix, which is a, a Wham Mega Mix, and yeah. I presume he used it to try and argue that. Um, he should be able to do it because they'd already given permission to uh, have a mega mix. Um, but I never got the cover back actually. <laughs> um, but I have did, got did it. He, did he copy the, the structure of your one? No, no, to be fair. No, I, didn't, I didn't engineer that. And Nigel Wright put that together. And I yeah. went to Nigel's studio and just mixed it down there. There were other mixes that sort of around that time that copied my structure of some of my mixes but I don't there weren't anything to do with um Nigel or Simon um but anyway yeah so 
So you started to work with with Energize as well. Is that a lot further in the future, or is it? Something? Yeah, quite a bit in the future. That that's more in the last ten years or so. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I've done loads for mainly for Peter Wilson. Um, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, but they just keep coming back asking me to do things. But mm. I've, I've done so much in the last few years. Do you know I've done somebody put on Facebook? Now, I think I've done seventy odd retro style remixes now in the last 10 years something like that which is an awful lot mm. and I've, I've been working with recently i've been working with um the big nasty doing a grime record um, and i've done a, a complete album for a show which i ended up playing most of that myself mm. uh, lead guitar solos all sorts which i've never really done before and, and drums and bass um and that that show got put on the back burner because of the, the uh, pandemic the, the lockdown started just before that was due to go on. So that was that. And I've been mm. doing other stuff. I've been making music for the big reunion. If you ever saw that show. Yeah. Yeah. I had to recreate backing tracks for the bands that we're using on there. And they had to be exactly the same. There was no karaoke version. It had to be exactly the same sounds and everything, which mm. was quite, quite uh, tricky, to be honest. Mm. But got there without did quite a few even did raw katie perry's raw did that, that we made that back in back you won't tell the difference between really the katie perry one and my one i'll play it mm. so, mm. you've really worked consistently throughout you haven't had a period where you i not did been... i did have a period around about 2002 mm. it went very very quiet and there was a point where nobody wanted to work with me because kylie and they didn't want to sound like kylie it all got a bit r b you know and and I, I, I wrote to loads of management companies looking for a manager and nobody would take me on. Um, except one guy said, uh, you should meet my, one of my writer guys that I manage. Um, I'll send him round. And he came round this guy called Bruce Elliott Smith. Um, we wrote, he, he was keen on writing over backing tracks. He was signed to Notting Hill Music. And he just used to write top lines over backing tracks that DJs had made, whatever. And we, uh, we did one in my house and then we did another and then I sold my house because it was too big for us my son had left we, we were in between places so to speak didn't have a studio so my brother said why don't you set up in in the back room of the club he was running a social club a railway club he said I don't use that room you can use it I said okay great because I had this remix to do for Elton John that time you know so I set up a quick computer and monitors and speakers in this room and Bruce and I worked there sort of one or two days a week um, and then we did the that record um, by Angel City uh, Love Me Right mm. oh, she, uh, remember that one it was a big record big club yeah. record and that sort of started off we started getting a bit more work through that that was probably the quietest period I had and then the day I left Bruce I started getting loads of work again from all sorts of different angles from different people, record companies, and I don't know how it goes. Um, it just goes like that. Sometimes mm. it's feast or famine, isn't it? Very often. Mm. So, so, so looking at pretty busy ever since then, you know. Mm. Now with the lockdown, it's been a bit quieter. Yeah, so I've been working. I've, I've been doing a three three children from from Milton Keynes. Uh, one's ten, one's twelve, and one's six, and they've written this Christmas song and they played it down the phone to me. And I, I sent them back a rough backing track, but they could sing out because it was just their dad tapping on the table, you know. Mm. And they sent me a load of things they fancied, and I, we made a record, and it sounds really great. Mm. And they're really talented, they're really clever lyrics, and um, they're really determined. One's got Asperger's, one of the guys, it's a little girl as well, she's all right, but one, one of the, I think the 10 year old boy's got Asperger's, but it's very mm. creative. How long have you had this studio here then? 2003, I think. Oh, okay. Or 2004, about then. It's been some yeah. time now. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to just explain what gear you've got in, in there? What, what desk you've got and yes. what you use? But, yeah. Have you finished with me on the musical stuff then? Yeah. Can, there's so much I can tell you, just I never know which way to turn sometimes. Anyway, this is a Mackie desk here. It's a 32 8. Um, mm. Got a bit crackly these days, um, needs a clean out, but I only use two channels, these two here, for the output of the computer. 
And I use this one here for my guitar um, when I'm playing guitar. Um, this one is the feed from the TG500 module that I've got up here that I use for some, mainly piano. I like the piano sound. Um, there's another channel here for the microphone, which is packed away at the moment. Um, I use a, an Audio Technica microphone, it's a really fab mic, not that expensive and, and really, really good. And that channel is where my bass is plugged into, my DX7 over here. If you, uh... Anyway, that's the sound that everybody wants on these PWL records. Yeah. You can only really get it out of the DX7. Yeah. I the microphone the, the <laughs> went flat and it lost its memory, so I had to program that from scratch again. And they really yeah. programmed those. those this used to be an automatic man. Um, and then we've got, this is all gunky really, it's just a compressor in there that I use for singing. Um, we've got the computer there, which is a very powerful computer. It's a PC, it's not a Mac. Um, and there's a the computer down there, there's two screens, that's a profit five. Uh, I'll bring you in, you can have a better look. Excuse me if I wobble it a bit. Can you see that better? Yeah. Yeah. And then we've got all the discs up here. Can you see those? Oh, wow. Yeah. Brilliant. And then some more discs there and more over there. Yeah, you can see those computers, guitars, more discs up there. Give you a little tour there. The speakers, yeah. AR18s I use. They're fab speakers. They really are. I've had those for 30 years, I think. Yeah. Um, nothing else really. It's just all in the computer these days. Yes, of course. Yeah. I like looking at real instruments myself. I mean, do you miss not playing, or do you play the the guitar? I play still? a lot now. I play more than anything. I'm playing guitar and bass more than ever now. Really? Yeah. I don't know why it's gone that way. I, when I did the Alphabet remix, the first that was the first one that was um, that job was given to me by uh, his name's escaped me. He used to work at PWL re until recently. I'll think of your name in a minute. Ian. Um, yeah, I, they wanted a I can't help it kind of feel to it, you know, the mm -hmm. banana armor thing. Um, so I got my mate Roddy Matthews in to play guitar because I didn't think I could do that. But after getting him in and watching him do it, I thought, well, I could do that, to be honest, you know, with a, a couple of tapes here and a bit of jiggery pokery and that. So then I decided after that to do all my own guitar parts. So I do that now. And, and the bass, I've got two basses, one of them. Um, I've got a bat bass as well. It, it looks like a it's all covered in Batman comics and lack of mm. quite original. But I do a lot of bass playing now. It's people, people like the live bass, and sometimes you can't do it any other way than playing live. And some of the things you want to do, you, know, you can't really get them out of the computer. So I'm quite happy to play. I enjoy doing the bass. Yeah. But keyboards, I, I don't play them live, I do them all in, in step. Mm. <laughs> I work it out live first and then just. Mm, yeah, I do the same. Yeah. So I, I moved forward perhaps a little quickly. Is there anything in the last 20 years that you particularly wanted to mention before we bring things to a close? Anything that you always. Or is that the wrong question, really? Because there's so much. There's so much, yeah. I mean, God. I mean, I, I did. The high points were getting a couple of big records in America. Yeah. Highly remix and. Um, and Plums Hang On when that went number one in, was it number two? I think it went to number one in the Billboard mm. top eight charts. Having those records was, um, I'm surprised that, it, you know, with the Kylie one, I'm surprised they didn't ask for any more of those because everybody loved it so much. If you, if you go to the um, the YouTube, um, on YouTube, they put, put your hands up remix. And read all the comments, there's thousands of comments there, and they're all saying the best thing she's done for ages. So it surprises me they don't let me do another one. I actually emailed Jamie Nelson the other day and said, uh, you know, people are saying, can I do another Kylie one? I didn't get a reply. Um, so, God knows. 
Mm. The industry is like that sometimes, isn't it? Um, so I think uh, we'll leave it there for now. So, so thank you so much for... Uh, That's all right. Nice to get us. Yes, it is. Uh, and one day we'll actually be in the same room together, hopefully. So, sure, so yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so, so thanks very much for, for your time, Pete, and uh, look forward to meeting you one day in person. I'm sure we will. Yeah.